It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen D. Minnis, with uh, the president of Benedictine College. He is a native of St. Joseph, Missouri. President Minnis graduated from Benedictine College in 1982. He obtained his Juris Doctorate degree from Washburn University in 1985 and a Master's of Business Administration degree in 1993 from Baker University. President Minnis began his legal career in the County Prosecutor's Office for Johnson County, Kansas. He held the position of Director, State Regulatory, and General Attorney at Sprint Corporation for 14 years. He served as President of the Benedict Benedictine College Alumni Association from 1991 to 1995 and joined the Benedictine College Board of Directors in 1992, serving until October 2004 when he became president of the college. He was honored with the Benedictine's Kansas Monk Award as an outstanding alumnus in 2001 and co-chaired the college's successful 2004 scholarship ball. In 2004, President Minnis was appointed as president of Benedictine College. Since his appointment, Benedictine College has seen unprecedented growth and enrollment has increased from 1,000 students to over 1,700, a record. Benedictine has built 10 new residence halls, a new academic center, a Marion Grotto, put field turf on both the football and soccer facility, opened a campus in Florence, Italy, began a nursing program and an engineering program making it one of the few liberal arts schools in America with an engineering. During his presidency, Benedictine has for the first time been recognized by U.S. News & World Report as one of America's best colleges and recognized by the Cardinal Newman Society as one of the top 20 Catholic universities in America. The college has just completed a capital campaign in which the goal was 50 million and over 70 million was raised. The school has been recognized by the U.S. bishops as President Minnis is one of only five Catholic University presidents to be appointed to the Commission on Catholic Universities in America and has been recognized by the Vatican as one of only four Catholic University presidents to be appointed to the Vatican Commission on the Church in America. This group has met in Rome and Mexico City at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. This group is sponsored by Pope Francis and is chaired by Cardinal Oriette and co-chaired by Cardinal Dolan. Cardinal O'Malley, Archbishop Shephu, and other Latin American Cardinals. President Minnis is married to Amy, a 1984 graduate of Benedictine College, and has three children, Matthew, Michael, and Molly. It is my great honor to introduce Doc, Doc, President Minnis. I see here where I think your next speaker is going to be Archbishop Lucas, right? So that's going to be exciting. It reminds me, the last time I, I gave a talk like this was at a uh, deal up in the Twin Cities and <clears throat> as I was finishing as I was walking back to my chair the the uh, the guy comes up to the thing and goes oh hey guys Steve that was great next month we're gonna have the greatest speaker we've ever had here at this thing <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was George Weigel so he really was the greatest speaker they'd ever had so but so anyway so next month you'll have the greatest speaker you've ever had here at this deal well, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. This is really nice of you to invite me here to this great group. I'm going to get out and walk around, but I want to make sure I, th I thank Deacon Chuck uh, for your uh, invitation. What a fantastic opportunity for us. We have a lot of Ravens in this audience here. Why don't you, all, all my Ravens, why don't you raise your hands. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, Rosemary Wilkerson came with me. Uh, she's in the development office, uh, came from Atchison with me, drove up yesterday. We had a wonderful time here. I want to introduce a, a new graduate uh, here. Odo Maxwell has been very nice and gracious and hospitable. Why don't you raise your hand, Odo? Uh, Odo is a recent graduate of Benedictine College from Omaha, Nebraska, so thank you. <clears throat> You may know of uh, his father, Chip Maxwell, who is going to run for, has held office here, and is going to run for Congress, but Odo's a fantastic alum for us. And then we also have a new Raven, Megan Clausen is here. Megan is going to be a freshman for us next year, so that's great. And I can't uh, go without telling you how proud we are of our alums who uh, have uh, uh, followed their vocation. Father Joe Taphorn is an alum of Benedictine College, and we're excited about having Father Joe here. Thank you, Father, for being here. <clears throat> also, Father Dan Andrews, many of you may know him, of him. He's also a diocesan in this diocese. And then uh, the newest 
uh, soon to be priest is a graduate who's graduating in May. Paul Florsch is going to join the seminary, and he's a Creighton Prep graduate from Omaha, and he's coming back. And I think he goes to St. Louis for. I think that's right for seminary. So we're excited about that to have produced him. He's just a fantastic I, gosh. I hope that he'll be assigned to one of your parishes someday. He's just the most ba best kid in the world. Um, you know, he was a soccer player for us, captain of the team. Uh, the Heart of America Conference every year picks the champion of character for the entire conference and all the sports, and he was the heart. Of, of America Conference champion of character this past year and so he's an Omaha so you should be proud of him. Okay anytime we have uh, a group of uh, good Catholics together I always uh, have to tell my uh, Lou Holtz story. You guys know Lou Holtz. He's on ESPN, commentator, right? Former Notre Dame football coach. And he's become a real good friend of Benedictine College. And so we've been honored to have him come to our campus a couple times. He came in 2007 and was our commencement speaker. Now this is a guy, uh, he charges for, for a speech. He charges a little uh, more than I do uh, for, for a speech. He's about a twenty to $30,000 a speech guy, right? But he was going to come and be our commencement speaker, and he says, I'm not going to charge you anything for this speech, and I don't want any reimbursement for my travel, which was really pretty awesome because we weren't going to pay him anyway. But, uh, so, <clears throat> but that was nice to him for him to offer. So anyway, he comes on our campus, and uh, he gets out of the car, and I welcome him. I say, Coach, great to have you here, Benedictine College. And he said, I've been on your website, and I see that you want to build a grotto on campus, a Marian grotto uh, dedicated to Our Lady of Lourdes. And I'm so excited for you to do that, and here I want to be the first donor to that grotto. And he handed me a $5,000 check to kick, a, kick off our campaign for the grotto. I know that was really just really awesome. Um, actually, I'll tell you another side of the story. So on Monday, I get a call from after, after the commencement. On Monday, I get a call from his assistant. And she says, oh, guys, Coach had a great time at your campus. Uh, but he was wondering something. Next month, he's going to go to Rome. And he wants to know if you can get him in to see the Pope. I said, well, I'm not really all that good of friends with the Pope, OK? I don't know what I can do. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, uh, the Archbishop got to meet him. I'll call the Archbishop and see what he can do. The Archbishop apparently wrote a letter and uh, got him uh, on the dais there for the for an audience and actually got to shake his hand and everything I get a picture with uh, he and his wife and his granddaughter and about a month later I get another I get a letter from Lou Holtz saying hey thanks for getting me in to see the Pope and he sent me another uh, donation check so I thought okay that's pretty awesome <laughs> so, so uh, we fast forward to 2012 and we've invited him back to campus and he's going to be our, our convocation speaker okay so he's going to come in on Monday night speak on Tuesday. About a week ahead of time, he wrote me and he said, uh, you know, my wife's been kind of sick and ill, and, but I'm still going to come, but I wish, I'd ask for you to pray for, uh, for Beth uh, since she's been a little ill. I said, Coach, we'd be glad to do that. So he comes on Monday night. I welcome him and I say, hey, Coach, you have not seen the grotto yet that you helped build. Let's go over and see that grotto. So we walk over there. And as we walk up there, there's over a hundred of our kids on their knees praying a rosary for his wife. Okay, what a great uh, experience for him. He's very touched and very moved. And so then he began to tell the story to, his, to our students. He says, oh my gosh, this means so much to me because Beth has been my best friend my entire life. And whenever I have an opportunity to speak, I tell people that, you know, finding a good spouse is so important that I've been in love with her, but she's always been my best friend. So I've been telling people this for years, right? And one day, I'm golfing with one of my buddies and he says, you know, coach, you tell everybody that your wife is your best friend. I got to tell you, <clears throat> uh, your dog is your best friend, not your wife. And he goes, no, 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 no. My wife is my best friend. He says, no, uh, your dog is your best friend. And I'll prove it to you. Tonight after we're done golfing, why don't you go home and take your dog and your wife and lock them in the trunk of your car for an hour and then see who's happier to see you when you come back and open the door. <laughs> so anyway, so. So that's a Lou Holtz story. Um, <laughs> he also, Lou, Lou also has one of my greatest quotes all the time. I, I use every time I see my, uh, my uh, wife's mother. I said, uh, you know, he always says, you know, behind every successful man is a surprised mother-in-law, right? <laughs> and so anyway, but, but that's another little Anyway, so I'm so excited about uh, uh, seeing. I want to tell you a little bit. Today I was hoping to tell you a little bit about the college, but more importantly, I want to t talk to you about the importance of having a strong mission, a mission in your business and a mission in your life, okay, and living up to that mission. And I think it, uh, I'm just going to tell our story because I think it'll be a great example for you 
about how important that is. So we were founded in 1858, Benedictine College, founded in 1858 in Atchison, Kansas. It's about uh, 40 minutes or so north of Kansas City on the Kansas and Missouri border, okay? So this is three years before the Civil War, founded on the Kansas-Missouri border. You guys know your history, not a great place to start anything, right? But the monks were tough, the Benedictine monks were tough. They wanted to start a school for the Lord's service there, and they did that. Now, to put our longevity in perspective about how long we've been around, how we stood the test of time, uh, of all the colleges and universities that were founded before the Civil War, 80% of them don't exist anymore. Okay? There are 250 Catholic colleges in America. There's only about 15 as old as we are. So we stood the test of time. To put it in real terms for everybody, we've been around so long, the Chicago Cubs have won a World Series since we've been founded, okay? So that'll kind of give you an idea about our longevity, all right? And so we always talk about our longevity, and we always talk about that we are a chosen place with a special mission, and that's why we've been around for so long. A chosen place with a special mission, chosen by the, by the Blessed Virgin Mary to be at this place and at this time and to be as successful as we are with, this special, with a special mission that I'll talk about in a second. But let me tell you why I think that we're a chosen place. Take yourself back to 1856, okay? Two years before we were founded, 1856, there's a, a priest named Father Henry Lemke. He has gone up north to a small town up north, and now he's making his way back to Atchison. It's in the summertime. It's hot. He hasn't had anything to eat or drink all day long, so he's uh, dehydrated, he's hungry, and he see, he, he, I read his diary, he feels a little delirious, okay, because of, because of the situation he's in. And now it's completely pitch black. Clouds have rolled in. And there's, I mean, this is years before P GPS or flashlights or anything, and he can't see, okay? He used to follow the tree line back to Atchison, but now he's lost. And uh, all of a sudden, the rain starts coming. You guys are in the Midwest. It was raining sideways, so you know what that means, just down, parental downpour. He finds himself now in a ditch, and water now has started to come upon him. And he writes in his diary, he said, he, he was in a state of mind, he didn't think, he didn't have hope, and he at that point thought that he was not going to make it alive, uh, through the night. And he, uh, Father Henry was a convert to the Catholic faith. Uh, he was a Lutheran minister, converted to Catholicism, <clears throat> became a Catholic priest. So he had never in his lifetime really called upon the Blessed Virgin Mary for any help, okay? But at that moment, he looked up to heaven and he says, Mary, I've never asked you for anything ever before, but if you can get me out of this, I'll be forever indebted to you and I'll be devoted to you the rest of my life. Those words leave his mouth <clears throat> and all of a sudden, in the distance, he sees this light uh, shining in the distance, very faint, but it's enough to give him hope. So at that moment, Father Henry has hope and he starts crawling out of this ditch, okay? And he starts crawling towards the light. And as he gets closer, he, no he sees that it's a lantern in this house that he never saw before because it was so dark. In the only window of this house is this lantern. So he goes to the house and he basically kind of crawls in there and falls in there. And uh, the wife, the uh, husband, and their nine-year-old daughter are in there. And they take him up and they know who he is. So they bring him in, they comfort him, get it, give him something to eat. And as he's sitting there, he says, tell me, ma'am, how did this light, how did this lantern get in this window? And she says, Father, this is the craziest story. Let me tell you, we had gone to bed early because of the storm and it was dark and everything like that. And we were sleeping. And all of a sudden, my daughter wakes up and starts calling for me. Mommy, mommy, come here, come here. So I get up, I light the lantern, and I put it in the window so I could see what's the matter. And she says, well, what's wrong, honey? And her daughter says, mommy, I was sleeping. And as I was sleeping, all of a sudden, a lady in white appeared at the foot of my bed and told me to wake you up. So the daughter wakes up, calls, the, uh, calls her mom, she lights the candle, puts it in the window. That's the candle that Father Henry saw. Father Henry in his diary says, I believe that that was the Blessed Virgin Mary that appeared to that young girl, okay? And put those, that, that in motion to save his life. Two years after that, he founds the college 
If, if, if the Blessed Virgin Mary doesn't intercede for him at that time, I'm not talking to you today. So we always believe that we're a chosen place, chosen by Mary to be at the place in this time, and we've called upon her numerous times throughout, uh, especially the last 10 years, to ask her for enrollment increases, to help build the new grotto, to help build uh, you know, a new building, and she has come through for us every time. It's been an amazing thing. We've We've started things called the Memorari Armies, people who are willing to pray a number of Memoraries for, for, uh, for help for the college, and she's always answered that call. And so we believe we're a chosen place. Now, uh, in my introduction, a lot of people, um, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what's been happening the last 10 years. But, you know, I, I told you, you know, we've been around for over 150 years, but I don't think that there's any question at this time and at this place, we have never been as successful as we are, and our futures never look brighter, okay? And, I mean, if you just take a little slice of the last 10 years, uh, I'll, I'll tell you just kind of kind of the neat things that have happened. Our enrollment's increased at 80% in the last 10 years. We've built 10 new residence hall buildings. we built a new academic building. We've renovated every classroom, renovated every dorm room on our campus in the last 10 years. Opened a campus in Florence, Italy. We've started majors in art and criminology and finance and international business. We've started a nursing program We've started an engineering program, as you heard. Uh, we've been recognized just in the last 10 years by U.S. News and World Report as one of America's best colleges. The Cardinal Newman Society was one of America's best Catholic colleges. First Things Magazine did an analysis of all 2,500 colleges and universities in America, came, up, came with their, their own top 25 list, and on that list was University of Chicago and Princeton and Duke and Notre Dame and Stanford, and at 18 was Benedictine College. And so a lot of great things are happening. There's only three schools in America that are a top 20 U.S. News School and a top 20 Cardinal Newman School, and we're one of those three. So all this great stuff is happening. And uh, a lot of people say, okay, so what's the secret? What's going on and why now, right? And our answer is pretty simple. We believe we're a chosen place, but we also know that just within the last 10 years, we made a conscious decision that we were going to be a mission-driven place, okay? And that everything that we did, every decision we made, is going to be consistent with that mission. We have a monk that says, are you willing to go bankrupt for your beliefs? Are you willing to go bankrupt for your beliefs? And we think that if your beliefs are strong, and the answer to that question is yes, we don't think you'll ever go bankrupt because we think those beliefs will carry on to success every time, and that's exactly what's happened to us, okay? Uh, so what, what's, uh, let me t I'm going to talk about our mission a little bit because I think it's important for you to know, but I think it's also important for you to kind of get an idea of how you can create a mission for your business and for your life and for your family, okay? So we have the, uh, I always talk about our mission in pictures. We've got these four pillars to our mission. We're a Catholic college, we're a Benedictine college, a liberal arts college, and a residential college. Catholic, Benedictine, liberal arts, residential. And those pillars then support our mission, which is to educate our students within a community of faith and scholarship, okay? So for us, the integration of community and faith and scholarship and everything that we do is really unique in the marketplace, it's distinctive, and, and uh, allows us to not only have our students live the mission while they're at school, but also take that mission after they leave. And so how does it translate to after they leave? Community is this notion that, I tell the kids all the time, what's the worst, what's the worst penalty in prison? Solitary confinement, right? Because they know, and we know, that humans are a social being and that they're stronger together than we are separate. That's why community is so important, teamwork is so important, and community and teamwork develops leaders. So we're, we're developing America's future leaders through, our, through this concept com, of community. Faith, uh, I don't have to tell this group why faith is important, but let me tell you why it's important in a college setting. Studies will tell you that 80% of the kids going to college today have an active faith life, 80%. When they graduate in college, that number is reduced to 18%. That four years of college is the four most important faith formation years of their life. 80 to 18 percent. It's incredibly important to be at a place that understands that and develops that faith life and de creates programs to bring our kids closer to Jesus Christ and have an encounter with Him. 
And so how's it, how's it working for us? We know, we still, we know that we still get the 80% coming with an active faith life. We know that 90% of our kids will tell us that their faith increased while they were at Benedictine College. So it's working at our place and it's really important because we know that they want to be complete people after they leave college. And finally, scholarship. Uh, we, we're kind of, and you guys uh, experience this every day, we, we're uh, a little worried about this generation. We kind of think that they're becoming information rich but analysis poor. That these kids are getting bombarded by tons of information every day. We are too. You can pick out your phone and get just about any information you want, okay? <clears throat> the question is, is can they analyze that information uh, and make good decisions? We think the liberal arts does that for them because we're going to provide a foundation in art, in history, in literature, in theology, in philosophy, uh, in the sciences, in language, in culture, and then all of a sudden when they do get bombarded by this information, they'll be able to analyze it and make good decisions. So community, faith, and scholarship, when they live it here, they're going to live it after they leave. But, but just like anything in life, uh, like your business, like our, our college, if we don't have a strong foundation, well, we're not going to stand for very long, right? Our mission can't stand for very long. I'll give you a quick story. There, many of you uh, probably have heard of John Wooden, the former UCLA basketball coach, right? I'm sure, Coach, you know about John Wooden. Um, Mike Krzyzewski won his, what, fifth national title. Pretty impressive. He tied John Wooden for the most Final Fours. Um, so during his, during his tenure, this freaks me out, uh, he won national titles, basketball titles at UCLA in 1964, 1965, 1967, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, and 75. So uh, not, not a bad little run there, huh? So incredible guy, and he, how he won is that he would press the entire game and he pushed the ball up and down the court, okay? He recruited this kid named Lucius Allen out of Kansas City, Kansas, and Lucius tells me this story, okay? Lucius Allen's excited about going to UCLA because he really liked to run, push the ball up and down the court. He gets there for the very first practice, and Coach Wooden walks in as a freshman. He walks in, and uh, he's this old man with glasses, and Lucius Allen tells the story, you know, I thought this old man was just kind of kind of roll the balls out on the court, and we were just going to have fun for an hour, right? In walks John Wooden, and he says, all right, gentlemen, welcome to your first practice here at UCLA. I want you to take your shoes and socks off. Um, today we're going to teach you how to put your socks on and how to tie your shoes so you don't get blisters, okay? Because he knew that if you have good feet, you're going to be able to run, you're going to be able to cut, you're going to be able to play defense, you're going to be able to win ball games, you're going to be able to win championships. So what he was emphasizing to those kids is, oh sure, we're going to do all the fun stuff, but it's all about the foundation. It's all about the core. You have to have a strong foundation in order for you to succeed. And this is what's happening at Benedictine College. We got this great mission. We're building buildings. We're moving forward. We push ourselves as much as we can to greatness. But if we don't have that strong foundation, if we're not a Catholic college, one of our pillars, and we, we believe in truth and advertising, we're telling, going to tell people we're a Catholic college, we're going to mean it, okay? I told you a little bit about how we are, dedic are dedicated to our, the Blessed Virgin Mary and how we've consecrated ourselves to her formally uh, in, a, in a ceremony last year. And it was a beautiful thing for us. And this year, in fact, uh, I'll tell you, uh, our theme this year is, you're the one I have chosen. And this is part of a quote from Our Lady Guadalupe to St. Juan Diego. And she said to St. Juan Diego, there are many I could send, but you are the one I've chosen for this task. And so we took that and we told our kids that. This is going to be our theme this year. You are the one I've chosen. And it's, it becomes really important because when, I, uh, when, uh, when Megan applies to Benedictine College and she uh, is accepted, I sign the acceptance letters. And when I get that letter, I look at her name, I look at salutation, and as I write my name and write congratulations, I pray a Hail Mary for her and for every kid that gets accepted. And I pray that Mary goes into their, goes into, to their life and intercedes on their behalf to help them in their college decision and help them in life. So when I address the freshmen every year, I say, look, it, there's thousands of kids all over the country, right? And they're sitting in, in chairs just like you saying, oh yeah, I chose to go to this school. Oh yeah, I chose to go to this school. But at Benedictine College, Mary chose you to be here. You are the one I've chosen for this special task. So it's kind of powerful, I think. So understanding the Catholic faith, believing in that, that's an incredibly strong pillar for us.
The second pillar is Benedictine, okay? We're a Benedictine school, meaning they were founded by the Benedictine monks. The Benedictines are the oldest order in the Catholic Church. Uh, I know that this is kind of Jesuit territory up here with Creighton Prep and Creighton and everything like that. Uh, the Jesuits are kind of like mere pups, okay? They're only 500 years old. The, the Benedictines are 1,500 years old. We were around 1,000 years before St. Ignatius ran, uh, came about. Uh, and so 1,500 years ago, there's, there's some of this on your table. St. Benedict wrote the Rule of St. Benedict. It's an incredible document. If you ever have a chance to read it, chapter two is a powerful uh, chapter on leadership, okay? Uh, chapter four is so powerful. One of our sisters says she reads a sentence a day. She reads a sentence a day. It's very powerful, okay? Now, I'm also going to tell you that there's some pretty boring stuff in here, too. Uh, uh, what Psalms you, re you read in the middle of the night between Easter and Pentecost, um, my favorite chapter is chapter 22, which is the sleeping arrangements of the monks. Uh, they said uh, the monks should sleep in their own beds, uh, and, but they should not wear their knives to bed because uh, you may cut yourself. Uh, I think that's wonderful advice, okay? Uh, uh, but it doesn't really uh, help us run a college very well, right? So what we did is we took this rule and we said we want to develop a set of values for our students. This is, and so we, we created a set of 10 Benedictine College values. And I, I would suggest for your business, you ought to think about the same thing too. Become intentional about your mission. Become intentional about your values. And this is what we've done. So, this answers the question that parents ask us, that alums ask us. What kind of values do your kids have? Well, we think that we hope that they love Jesus Christ. We hope they understand the, the power of community and stewardship. Hospitality is a huge value of ours. Uh, St. Benedict writes, this is, I think this is so powerful, and I, I tell this to business leaders all the time. St. Benedict writes, every guest should be greeted as if they're Jesus Christ themselves. Every guest should be greeted as if they're Jesus Christ themselves. If you had a customer service department like that, uh, you'd be pretty strong, wouldn't you, right? Uh, when I first got hired, I went down to the registrar's office, and, and uh, I told our registrar, who just wasn't as being hospitable as I'd like her to be, right? And I said, you know, uh, when they come in and ask a question and they don't know the answer, uh, you need to treat them as if they're Jesus Christ. Greet them as, this, as if they're Jesus Christ himself. And the registrar says, yeah, well, you know, if they were Jesus Christ, they wouldn't have these questions, would they? I said, well, you know, I don't think she really got it, okay? But uh, anyway, so that's why she's the former registrar. Um, anyway, so, uh, Anyway, so I tell the kids all the time, look, you're a Benedictine college, you have a unique responsibility to treat everybody as if they're Jesus Christ themselves. So if Jesus was walking down the sidewalk, wouldn't you take your earbuds out of your ears and stop texting people and have a conversation with them? Probably, right? Now, not all our kids listen to me. They still put their earbuds sometimes in their ears, but, but this is, this is, these are incredible values and uh, values to live by. And these are great to adopt for your own business, or I would suggest adopting values for, uh, um, that, that would go for years. Uh, the third and fourth, liberal arts, residential. I kind of talked about the liberal arts, the power of that. And then final, the final pillar is, um, uh, is residential. We, ha we have a four-year residence requirement. We make everybody live on campus. We think that's the best way to learn how to live in community and, li and work within teams, and we, and we think it, it's powerful. Again, I'm only telling, uh, going in detail about our mission because I think it's important for you as business leaders to l have a mission in your business, have a mission in your life, have a mission in your family, and live by that mission. Ask yourself, am I willing to go bankrupt for my beliefs? Okay? And I think that's going to be very powerful for you. Uh, I'm going to end with one quick story here. As president of a college, um, as you may imagine, a lot of my job is fundraising. Okay. Uh, am I going over time? Am I doing okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, is, is fundraising. So a few years back, we were, build, we were raising money to build this new building on our campus. Okay, it was going to be a beautiful new academic building that eventually got built. We went down to Texas to talk to one of our alums. And this was in February, and he did this incredible stuff. He said, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to give you a million dollars, okay, for this building. I believe in it so much. And if you can raise six more million dollars by June the 15th, I'll give you an additional million dollars, okay? So we thought, oh my gosh, so from 
He's going to give us a million, and from February to June the 15th, we had to raise six more million dollars, and then he was going to give us a million on the backside. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. What a great challenge for us. Now, uh, raising that much money for us in that short a period of time is pretty tough, right? But we got on the ball. Rosemary was awesome. She went out there, and we really worked hard. Now, when I woke up on June the 15th, we were still $600,000 away from meeting our goal, okay? Uh, so I got up and I was still making calls uh, and I was a little pretty nervous. We had till 5 o'clock p.m. to meet that goal. That day, we were, we were blessed to have a guy named Mike Sweeney come on our campus. Many of you may remember Mike. I think he may even played in Omaha for a couple years before he went to the Royals. And he came on campus to t uh, talk to a leadership program that we were having. And he told this incredible story, I thought, very powerful. And he said, when he was uh, just coming up through the Royals organization, he would do this, and you guys know this probably by watching Omaha. You know, you'd, you'd have kids, uh, you'd have these players play uh, in the minors, and then in September they get called up to the major league club, and then in spring training he gets sitting down to the minors. And so he was up and down for about two or three years. After one season, the season was over, and the paper said, this is the year for Mike Sweeney. He has to go to spring training, and he has to make the big club, or the Royals are going to release him. Okay, so Sweeney is, is pumped, right? So he's working out and he's lifting weights and he's hit, hitting off the tees, doing everything he can to make the big league club. But all the reports in the papers get worse and worse and worse. Sweeney's going to be traded. Sweeney's going to be released. Sweeney's not going to be a royal. It was terrible. One day he decides to go over to one of the coach's houses and say, hey, what's, what's going on? And the coach said, <clears throat> I got to tell you, Mike, we just had a... Uh, meeting this morning and you probably have a zero percent chance of making the Royals this year. I just don't think it's going to happen. As you can imagine, Mike is devastated. I mean, he's absolutely devastated. He goes to, goes to noon mass at Nativity in Leewood. He's in the back pew, literally crying his eyes out because he just think his dream of being a major league ball player is, is coming to an end. And one of his friends sees him. And his friend walks over and he says, Mike, what's wrong? And so Mike pours his heart out. Oh, this is terrible, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so his friend says something really profound. He says, Mike, you know, you got to think of your life as a tandem bicycle, okay, one of these two-seaters. He says, right now you're on the front of that bike. You're pedaling as hard as you can, right? You're lifting weights and doing all the things you need to do. And right now you're guiding that bike so you'll be a Major League Baseball player. Mike, to be truly successful, you have to get on the back of that bike. You have to pedal as hard as you can. But you got to let God on the front. Let his will be done. And say, Jesus, I trust in you. And that you will guide me in the direction that you want me to be guided. And Mike listened to that and he says, you are exactly right. I've been trying to guide my own life. And I needed to step back. I need to get on the back of that bike. And I need to let God on the front. And let his will be done. So Mike, in his mind, decided to do that. So what happens? Goes off to spring training. He hits 400 makes the Royals, five-time All-Star, one of the highest paid Royals in their history. It's an incredible story, right? Well, I'm totally inspired, right? Of course, I've still got $600,000 to raise, you know, by, by five o'clock. But I walk out of there and I said, you know, God, I've been doing this all wrong. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get on the back of this bike the rest of this day. I'm going to pedal as hard as I can, but I'm going to let you on the front. If you want this to happen for, uh, for Benedictine College to get this extra million dollars, then it's going to happen. Literally, those words came out of my mouth, and I get a call from this guy from, from Denver, Colorado, I hadn't talked to in a year. And he says, yeah, you know, my wife and I have been talking about this. I think we're going to be in for 200000 I hang up. It rings almost immediately after that. Another guy for 100000 I hang up. And by noon that day, within an hour, we had raised the remaining $600,000 uh, for, uh, for that building. All because I was willing to get on the back of that bike. Let God's will be done. So anyway, so it's a great story. I wanted to uh, pass these out. I've got these little uh, stickers here when I do this. Uh, these are little tandem bicycle stickers. Put these on your computer to remind yourself to always get on the back of that bike. Pedal as hard as you can. It's a great story. Doesn't say you coast, right? You still work hard. What do they always say? Pray, uh, work as if it all depends on you, but pray as if it all depends on God. So you have to work hard, but you let God on, on the front. And let his will be done. I so appreciate uh, Deacon Chuck for, thank, for inviting me here to Benedictine College. And uh, I'm really excited about what you're doing here in this area. There's this, this renaissance of, 
the Catholic faith going on in Nebraska, these two great dioceses back to back, Omaha and Lincoln, are just amazing to me. And we can tell because we're getting the best kids that we have at Benedictine College from, the, uh, from this diocese. So I appreciate what you're doing with this group and what you're doing with your, with your family. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.